Hi friends, it's Hayley here from the Gale Library in Newton. I'm here with your Harry Potter Wednesdays. As you know, we are reading Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone by JK Rowling every Wednesday at 4.30, live in the library. And we're also following our chapter with some kind of Harry Potter type craft. So we've made magic wands. Last week we made dragon eggs. This week we're going to be doing some potion making, some bubbling potions. So if you're interested in learning how to make a bubbling potion, stay tuned at the end of the chapter and um, a craft video will follow showing you how to make a bubbling Harry Potter potion. So if you remember, we are now in chapter three. We left chapter two, which was called The Vanishing Glass, where Harry luckily got to go to the zoo for Dudley's birthday, um, but ended up talking to the snake and suddenly the glass vanished and the snake was able to escape. Um, of course, Harry was in trouble for for doing that, even though he didn't know how it, he managed it. Um, so that is where we left chapter three, uh, chapter two, sorry. <laughs> chapter three is called The Letters From No One, J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, chapter three. The escape of the Brazilian boa constrictor earned Harry his longest punishment ever. By the time he was allowed out of his cupboard again, the summer holidays had started and Dudley had already broken his new camera, crashed his remote control airplane and for the first and first time on his racing bike, knocked down old Miss Fig as she crossed pivot drive on her crutches. Harry was glad school was over, but there was no escaping Dudley's gang who visited the house every single day. Pierce, Dennis, Malcolm and Gordon were all big and stupid, but as Dudley was the biggest and stupidest of the lot, he was the leader. The rest of them were all quite happy to join in Dudley's favourite sport, Harry hunting. This is why Harry spent as much time as possible out of the house, wandering around and thinking about the end of the holidays, where he could see a tiny ray of hope. When September came, he would be going off to secondary school, and for the first time in his life, he wouldn't be with Dudley. Dudley had a place at Uncle Vernon's old school, Smeltings. Pierce Polkis was going there too. Harry, on the other hand, was going to Stonewall High, the local comprehensive. Dudley thought this was very funny. The stuff, they stuff people's heads down the toilets on their first day at Stonewall, he told Harry. Want to come upstairs and practice? No thanks, said Harry. The poor toilets never had anything as horrible as your head down it. It might be sick. Then he ran before Dudley could work out what he'd said. One day in July, Aunt Petunia took Dudley to London to buy his smeltings uniform, leaving Harry at Miss Fig's. Mrs. Fig wasn't as bad as usual. It turned out she'd broken her leg tripping over some of her cats, and she didn't seem quite as fond of them as before. She let Harry watch the television, gave him a bit of chocolate cake that tasted as though she'd had it for several years. That evening, Dudley paraded around the living room for the family in his brand new uniform. Smeltings boys wore maroon tailcoats, orange knickerbockers, and flat straw hats called boaters. They also carried knobbly sticks used for hitting each other while the teachers weren't looking. This was supposed to be good training for later in life. As he looked at Dudley in his new knickerbockers, Uncle Vernon said gruffly that it was the proudest moment of his life. Aunt Petunia burst into tears and she said she couldn't believe that at equal Dudleykins, he looked so handsome and grown up. Harry didn't trust himself to speak. He thought two of his ribs might already have cracked from trying not to laugh. There was a horrible smell in the kitchen next morning when Harry went in for breakfast. It seemed to be coming from a large metal tub in the sink. He went to have a look. The tub was full of what looked like dirty rags swimming in gray water. What's this? He asked Aunt Petunia. Her lips tightened as they always did if he dared to ask a question. Your new school uniform, she said. Harry looked in the bowl again. Oh, he said. I didn't realize it had to be so wet. Don't be stupid, snapped Aunt Petunia. I'm dyeing some of Dudley's old things gray for you. It'll look just like everybody else's when I finished. Harry seriously doubted this, but thought it best not to argue. He sat down at the table and tried not to think about how he was going to look in his first day at Stonewall High, like he was wearing bits of old elephant skin, probably. Dudley and Uncle Vernon came in, both with wrinkled noses because of the smell from Harry's new uniform. Uncle Vernon opened his newspaper as usual, and Dudley banged his smelting stick which he carried everywhere, on the table. They heard the click of a letterbox and a flop of letters onto the doormat. Get the post, Dudley, said Uncle Vernon from behind his paper. Make Harry get it. Get the post, Harry. Make Dudley get it. Poke him with your smelting stick, Dudley. Harry dodged the smelting stick and went to get the post. Three things lay on the doormat. 
a postcard from Uncle Vernon's sister Marge, who was holidaying on the Isle of Wight, a brown envelope that looked like a bill, and a letter for Harry? Harry picked it up and stared at it, his heart twanging like a giant elastic band. No one ever in his whole life had written to him. Who would? He had no friends, no other relatives. He didn't belong to the library, so he never even got rude notes asking for books back. Yet here it was, a letter, addressed so plainly that there could be no mistake. Mr. H. Potter, the cupboard under the stairs, four pivot drive, little winding, Surrey. The envelope was thick and heavy, made of yellowish parchment, and the address was written in emerald green ink. There was no stamp. Turning the envelope over, his hand trembling, Harry saw a purple wax seal bearing a coat of arms, a lion, an eagle, a badger, and a snake surrounding a large letter H. Hurry up, boy, shouted Uncle Vernon from the kitchen. What are you doing? Checking for letter bombs? He chuckled at his own joke. Harry went back into the kitchen, still staring at his letter. He handed Uncle Vernon the bill and the postcard, sat down and slowly began to open the yellow envelope. Uncle Vernon ripped open the bill, snorted in disgust and flipped over the postcard. Marge is ill, he informed Aunt Petunia. Ate a funny whelk. Dad, said Dudley suddenly. Dad, Harry's got something. Harry was on the point of unfolding his letter, which was written on the same heavy parchment as the envelope, when it was jerked sharply out of his hands by Uncle Vernon. That's mine, said Harry, trying to snatch it back. Who'd be writing to you, sneered Uncle Vernon, shaking the letter open with one hand and glancing at it. His face went from red to green faster than the set of traffic lights, and it didn't stop there. Within seconds, it was the greyish white of old porridge. P P Petunia, he gasped. Dudley tried to grab the letter and read it, but Uncle Vernon held it high out of his reach. Aunt Petunia took it curiously and read the first line. For a moment, she looked as though she might faint. She clutched her throat and made a choking noise. Vernon, oh my goodness, Vernon. They stared at each other, seeming to have forgotten that Harry and Dudley were still in the room. Dudley was used to being ignored. Dudley wasn't used to being ignored. He gave his father a sharp tap on the head with a smelting stick. I only want to read that letter, he said loudly. I want to read it said Harry furiously, as it is mine. Get out, both of you, croaked Uncle Vernon, stuffing the letter back inside its envelope. Harry didn't move. I want my letter, he shouted. Let me see it, demanded Dudley. Out, roared Uncle Vernon, and he took both Harry and Dudley by the scruffs of their necks and threw them into the hall, slamming the kitchen door behind them. Harry and Dudley promptly had a furious but silent fight over who would listen at the keyhole. Dudley won, so Harry, his glasses dangling from one ear, lay flat on his stomach to listen between the crack in the door and the floor. Vernon, Aunt Petunia was saying in a quivering voice, look at the address. How could they possibly know where he sleeps? You don't think they're watching the house? Watching? Spying? Might be following us, Vernon muttered, mut Uncle Vernon muttered wildly. But what should we do, Vernon? Should we write back? Tell them we don't want... Harry should, could see that Uncle Vernon's shiny black shoes pacing up and down the kitchen. No, he said finally. No, we'll just ignore it. If they don't get an answer, yes, that's best. We won't do anything. But I'm not having one in the house, Petunia. Didn't we swear when we took him in we'd stamp out that dangerous nonsense? That evening, when he got back from work, Uncle Vernon did something he'd never done before. He visited Harry in his cupboard. Where's my letter? said Harry, the moment Uncle Vernon had squeezed through the door. Who's writing to me? No one. It was addressed to you by mistake, said Uncle Vernon shortly. I have burned it. It was not a mistake, said Harry ang angrily. It had my cupboard on it. Silence, yelled Uncle Vernon, and a couple of spiders fell from the ceiling. He took a few deep breaths and then forced his face into a smile, which looked quite painful. Um, yes, Harry, about this cupboard. Your aunt and I have been thinking. You're really getting a bit bit for it. We think it might be nice if you moved into Dudley's second bedroom. Why? said Harry. Don't ask questions, snapped his uncle. Take this stuff upstairs now. De Dursley's house had four bedrooms, one for Uncle Vernon and Aunt Petunia, one for visitors, usually Uncle Vernon's sister Marge, one where Dudley slept, and one where Dudley kept all the toys and things that wouldn't fit into his first bedroom. It only took Harry one trip upstairs to move everything he owned from the cupboard to this room. He sat down on the bed and stared around him. Nearly everything in here was broken. The month-old camera was lying on top of the small working tank Dudley had once driven over next door's dog. In the corner was Dudley's first ever television set, which he'd put his foot through when his favourite programme had been cancelled. There was a large birdcage, which had once held a parrot that Dudley had swapped at school for a real air rifle, which was now on top of the shelf, 
with the end all bent because Dudley had sat on it. Other shelves were full of books. They were the only things in the room that looked as though they'd never been touched. From downstairs came the sound of the Dudleys bawling at his mother. I don't want him in there. I need that room. Make him get out. Harry sighed and stretched out on the bed. Yesterday, he'd have given anything to be up here. Today, he'd rather be back in his cupboard with that letter than up here without it. Next morning at breakfast, everyone was rather quiet. Dudley was in shock. He'd screamed, whacked his father with his smelting stick, been sick on purpose, kicked his mother and thrown his torches through the greenhouse roof and he still didn't have his room back. Harry was thinking about this time yesterday and bitterly wishing he'd never opened the letter in, bish, excuse me, bitterly wishing he'd opened the letter in the hall. Uncle Vernon and Aunt Petunia kept looking at each other darkly. When the post arrived, Uncle Vernon, who seemed to be trying to be nice to Harry, made Dudley go and get it. They heard him banging things with his smelting sticks all the way down the hall. Then he shouted, There's another one! Mr. H. Potter, the smallest room, four pivot drive. With a strangled cry, Uncle Vernon leapt from his seat and ran down the hall. Harry ran right behind him. Uncle Vernon had to wrestle Duddy to the ground to get the letter from him, which was made difficult by the fact that Harry had grabbed Uncle Vernon around the neck from behind. After a minute of a confusing fight, in which everyone got hit a lot by the smelting stick, Uncle Vernon straightened up, gasping for breath, with Harry's letter clutched in his hand. Go to your cupboard. I mean your bedroom, he wheezed at Harry. Dudley, just go. Harry walked around and around his new room. Someone knew he had moved out of his cupboard, and they seemed to know that he hadn't received his first letter. Surely that meant they'd try again. This time, he'd make sure they didn't fail. He had a plan. The repaired alarm clock rang at six o'clock the next morning. Harry turned it off quickly and, pressed, and dressed silently. He mustn't wake the Dursleys. He stole downstairs without turning on any lights. He was going to wait for the postman on the corner of Pivot Drive and get the letters for number four first. His heart hammered as he crept across the dark hall towards the front door. Ah! He leapt into the air. He trodden on something big and squashy on the doormat. Something alive! Lights clicked on upstairs, and to his horror, Harry realised that the big squashy something had been his uncle's face. Uncle Vernon had been lying at the foot of the front door in a sleeping bag, clearly making sure Harry didn't do exactly what he'd been trying to do. He shouted at Harry for about half an hour, and then told him to go make a cup of tea. Harry shuffled miserably off into the kitchen, and by the time he got back, the post had arrived, right into Uncle Vernon's lap. Harry could see three letters addressed in green ink. I want, he began, but Uncle Vernon was tearing these letters into pieces before his eyes. Uncle Vernon didn't go to work that day. He stayed at home and nailed up the letterbox. See, he explained to Aunt Petunia through a mouthful of nails. They can't deliver them. They'd just give up. I'm not sure that will work, Vernon. Oh, these people's minds work in strange ways, Petunia. They're not like you and me, said Uncle Vernon, trying to knock in a nail with a piece of fruitcake Aunt Petunia had just bought him. On Friday, no fewer than 12 letters arrived for Harry. As they couldn't go through the letterbox, they had been pushed under the door, slotted around the sides, and a few even forced through the small window in the downstairs toilet. Uncle Vernon stayed at home again. After burning all the letters, he got out a hammer and nails and boarded up the cracks around the front and back doors so no one could go out. He hummed, tiptoed through the tulips as he worked, and jumped at small noises. On Saturday, things began to get out of hand. 24 letters to Harry found their way into the house, rolled up and hidden inside each of two dozen eggs that their very confused milkman had handed to Aunt Petunia through the living room window. While Uncle Vernon made furious telephone calls to the post office and the da dairy trying to find someone to complain to, Aunt Petunia shredded the letters in her food mixer. Why on, who on earth wants to talk to you this badly? Dudley asked Harry in amazement. On Sunday morning, Uncle Vernon sat down at the breakfast table looking tired and rather ill, but happy. No post on Sundays, he reminded them happily as he spread marmalade on his newspapers. <laughs> no damn letters today. Something came whizzing down the kitchen chimney as he spoke and caught him sharply on the back of the head. Next moment, 30 or 40 letters came pelting out of the fireplace like bullets. The Dursleys ducked, but Harry kept leaping into the air trying to catch one. Out! Out! Uncle Vernon seized Harry around the waist and threw him into the hall. When Aunt Petunia and Dudley had run out with their arms over their faces, Uncle Vernon slammed the door shut. They could hear all the letters still streaming into the room, bouncing off walls and floor. That does it, said Uncle Vernon, trying to speak calmly, but pulling great tufts of hair moustache at the same time. 
I want you all back here in five minutes, ready to leave. We're going away. Just pack some clothes, no arguments. He looked so dangerous with half his moustache missing that no one dared to argue. Ten minutes later, they had wrenched their way through the boarded up doors and were in the car, speeding towards the motorway. Dudley was sniffling in the back seat. His father had hit him round the head for holding them up while he tried to pack his television, video and computer in his sports bag. They drove and they drove. Even Apertunia didn't dare ask where they were going. Every now and then, Uncle Vernon would take sharp turns and drive in the opposite direction for a while. Shake him off, shake him off, he would mutter whenever he did this. They didn't stop to eat or drink all day. By nightfall, Dudley was howling. He'd never had such a bad day in his life. He was hungry. He'd missed five television programs he'd wanted to see, and he'd never gone so long without blowing up an alien on his computer. Uncle Vernon stopped at last outside a gloomy looking hotel on the outskirts of a big city. Dudley and Harry shared a room with twin beds and a damp, musty sheets. Dudley snored, but Harry stayed awake, sitting on the windowsill, staring down at the lights of the passing cars and wondering. They ate stale cornflakes and cold tin tomatoes on toast for breakfast the next day. They had just finished when the owner of the hotel came over to their table. Excuse me, but is one of you Mr. H. Potter? Only I got about a hundred of these at the front desk. She held up a letter so they could read the green inked address. Mr. H. Potter, room 17, Railview Hotel, Cokeworth. Harry made a grab for the letter, but Uncle Vernon knocked his hand out of the way. The woman stared. I'll take them, said Uncle Vernon, standing up quickly and following her from the dining room. Wouldn't it just be better to go home, dear? Aunt Petunia suggested tim timidly hours later, but Uncle Vernon didn't seem to hear her. Exactly what was he looking for? None of them knew. He drove them into the middle of a forest, got out, looked around, shook his head, got back in the car and off they went again. The same thing happened in the middle of a plough field, ploughed field, halfway across a suspension bridge and at the top of a multi-storey car park. Daddy's gone mad, hasn't he? Dudley asked Aunt Petunia dully late that afternoon. Uncle Vernon had parked at the coast, locked them all inside the car and disappeared. It started to rain. Great drops beat on the roof of the car. Dudley snivelled. It's Monday, he told his mother. The great Humberto's on tonight. I want to stay somewhere with a television. Monday? This reminded Harry of something. If it was Monday, and you could usually count on Dudley to know the days of the week because of television, then tomorrow, Tuesday, was Harry's 11th birthday. Of course, his birthdays were never exactly fun. Last year, the Dursleys had given him a coat hanger and a pair of Uncle Vernon's old socks. Still, you were at 11 every day. Uncle Vernon was back and he was smiling. He was also carrying a long, thin package and didn't answer Aunt Petunia when she asked what he'd bought. Found the perfect place, he said. Come on, out, everyone. It was very cold outside the car. Uncle Vernon was pointing at what looked like a large rock way out to sea. Perched on the top of the rock was the most miserable little shack you could imagine. One thing was certain, there was no television in there. Storm forecast for tonight, said Uncle Vernon gleefully, clapping his hands together, and this gentleman's kindly agreed to lend us his boat. A toothless man came ambling up to them, pointing with a rather wicked grin at an old rowing boat bobbing in the iron grey water below them. I've already got some rations, said Uncle Vaughan, Vernon, so it's all aboard. It was freezing in the boat. Icy sea spray and rain crept down their necks and a chilly wind whipped their faces. After what seemed like hours, they reached the rock, where Uncle Vernon, slipping and sliding, led the way to the broken down house. The inside was horrible. It smelled strongly of seaweed. The wind whistled through the gaps in the wooden walls and the fireplace was damp and empty. There were only two rooms. Uncle Vernon's rations turned out to be packets of crisps, to be a packet of crisps each and four bananas. He tried to start a fire, but the empty crisp packets just smoked and shriveled up. Could do with some of these letters now, eh? He said cheerfully. He was on very good mood. Obviously, he thought nobody stood a chance of reaching them here in a storm to deliver post. Harry privately agreed, though the thought didn't cheer him up at all. As night fell, the promised storm blew up around them. Spray from the high waves splattered the walls of the hut and a fierce wind rattled the filthy windows. Ampetunia found a few mouldy blankets in the second room and made up a bed for Dudley on the moth-eaten sofa. She and Uncle Vernon went off to the lumpy bed next door and Harry was left to find the softest bit of floor he could find and curl up under the thinnest, most ragged blanket. The storm raged more and more furiously as the night went on. Harry couldn't sleep. He shivered and turned over, trying to get comfortable, his stomach rumbling with hunger. 
Dudley's snores were drowned out by the low rolls of thunder that started near midnight. The lighted dial of Dudley's watch, which was dangling over the edge of the sofa on his fat wrist, told Harry he'd been 11 for 10 minutes, he'd be 11 in 10 minutes time. He lay and watched his birthday tick nearer, wondering if the Dursleys would remember at all, wondering where the letter writer was now. Five minutes to go. Harry heard something creak outside. He hoped the roof wasn't going to fall in, although it might be warmer if it did. Four minutes to go. Maybe the house in Pivot Drive would be so full of letters when they got back that he'd be able to steal one somehow. Three minutes to go. Was that the sea slapping hard on the rock like that? And two minutes to go. What was that funny crunching noise? Was the rock crumbling into the sea? One minute to go and he'd be 11. 30 seconds, 20, 10, nine. Maybe he'd wake Dudley up just to annoy him. Three, two, one, boom! The whole shack shivered and Harry sat bolt upright, staring at the door. Someone was outside, knocking to come in. That was the end of chapter three, Letters from No One. We will be here next week with chapter four, The Keeper of the Keys. Um, but meanwhile, stay tuned for our Harry Potter potions, um, bubbling potions, if you want to see how to make them, just keep watching. And I will see the rest of you guys that just want to listen to the story next Wednesday, 4.30. Don't forget, we're doing it live in the library. So please come on down and see me in person. All right, you guys, take care. Have a wonderful Wednesday. Bye. Hi friends, it is Harry Potter Wednesday and our craft for our Harry Potter Wednesday today is potion making. So we're going to make some potions this afternoon um, and I just thought I'd do a quick video demo in case you couldn't make it and you wanted to make a potion at home. So you can probably do this with all the items that you have in your house and I bet you could find these really easily. So I've got a jar. You can use a bottle or a jar or anything that you, you can uh, find in the house, which is clear. And you need it to be a little tall to hold the potion too. Um, you're also going to need some dish soap. You will need some white vinegar. <laughs> you will need some baking soda, some food coloring, and then anything else that you might want to add to the potion. So I've got some sparkles. I also got some googly eyes because I thought that would be fun. And I got some glitter too. Main ingredients. If you've ever made a volcano at school, you'll know that the main ingredients are the white wine vinegar and the baking soda. So the first thing we're going to do for our bubbling Harry Potter potion is find a tray that is not going to spill because this is going to explode over the tray. Um, and it makes a really cool potion. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take our white wine vinegar and we're going to pour maybe about half, fill up your, um, your container about halfway full, like that. That should be enough. I can always add more later. So I've got about half of my container full. Now what we're going to do, what makes this potion a bubbling potion is the washing up liquid. So I'm just gonna add a good dollop, which changes the color so it already becomes more potion-like, even just by adding a little bit of the washing up liquid. So I'm gonna give it a little mix there. All right. Next thing we're going to do is we can add, um, we can add the things that we want to put in our potion. We want to do this before it starts to bubble because once it starts to bubble over, um, we can't really add the sprinkles and the glitter because you will just be putting it onto a bubble. So we're going to do that first. So we're going to put, so I'm gonna add a few sprinkles, a few um, shiny things. I'm gonna add some glitter and I think I'm gonna go with red. Actually, I'll go with gold, make it Christmassy. <laughs> so we'll do some gold glitter. I'm also going to add some food coloring. So you can see once you start adding things, it kind of sinks down to the bottom to start with, but don't worry because it's all going to bubble up and some of it will actually bubble out over the top. So I'm going to, actually I'm gonna add color later. So for now, all I've got in there is my white wine vinegar, my washing up liquid and my sprinkles and things. I'm gonna add my eyes too. So I've got some googly eyes just to make it look spooky. Hopefully they'll sink to the bottom and be spooky. Now for the fun part. 
So I'm going to get all of my colors ready because what I'm gonna do, as it starts bubbling over, I'm actually going to add the color to see how the color splurts over the side, see what it looks like. So I've put some of my baking powder in a bowl here. And if you guys have done volcanoes, you'll know what happens next. So I'm gonna add, I don't know how much I need to add. So at the moment I've got a spoonful and I'm gonna see. So it bubbles up quite slowly, I'll add a little bit more. And our potions are bubbling potions. So it's coming up very cool and very slow and it's bringing up some of the things that I put in there. Now a really cool thing to do as your potion is bubbling is add some drops of color because what happens is it starts to bubble over the side and then it looks really awesome. So I added blue, I'm gonna add red and I'm just putting a couple of drops in. I don't know if you can see this, but it starts to <laughs> it starts to look really awesome as it comes over. I'm going with green. So it kind of plops in the middle, but then explodes out of the sides. It looks really cool. It's got this awesome effect, all the colors dripping out the side there. Let me go again here. Put some yellow in. And it's a really nice slow bubble so that you can see as you drop it in, the color just seems to bubble out of the side and it looks, it's really effective. And I'll actually show you inside the tub in a moment because it's got this rainbow going on. It looks very cool. So it's got a nice, slow Harry Potter potion-like bubble coming out of it. Isn't that awesome? So you don't need very much and it's still bubbling. Look, you can just keep adding color and it just bubbles up and over. <laughs> it looks really cool. It looks very cool from the top. Are you ready? I'm going to do some more. It's just going to bubble up and over and it looks very effective. I can't stop. I love it. <laughs> I'm do one more color then I'm going to show you inside my tray because it looks awesome. All right, you ready? You can see what it looks like on top. It looks very cool as it bubbles out and comes down into the tray and it's still bubbling yellow. <laughs> so that is it, you guys. That is how easy it is to make a Harry Potter potion. And you could just sit here for as long as it's still bubbling. It's still going over, it's still bubbling. And the slower it goes, the more effective it looks when you put that color in and it bubbles down into the tray. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. I hope you enjoyed our Harry Potter chapter three and our Harry Potter bubble potion making. Take care and have a wonderful week. Bye, you guys.